happy hour. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm really glad to see you all here today. We have a fantastic guest on a vital topic for higher education's future. And I'm really looking forward to our conversation. I'm absolutely delighted to have a, a wonderful person coming to us from the Department of Education. Now, we've had one Department of Education official on before, but never anyone quite like this. We have James Kval. He is the under, he's the United States Undersecretary for Higher Education. As far as I can tell, this is the highest ranking government official with a specific remit of focusing on colleges and universities. I have so many questions for him. We have so much to talk about. Uh, I'm going to begin by bringing him up on stage and I'll ask him a couple of questions, but then it's going to be up to you for your comments and your questions. So as we start talking, think about what you'd like to ask, what you'd like to learn, and what you'd like to share. Now, without any further ado, let me welcome Undersecretary Kvo. Good afternoon, sir. <laughs> Hi, Brian. Thanks for having me on. Oh, it's a pleasure. Then it's very good to see you. Where have we found you today? Uh, I'm here in my office in uh, downtown Washington, D.C. Excellent. Not too far from you, I suppose. No, if I'd known better, I would have hopped on the VRE and come and join you. But um, I'll do that next time. Well, maybe we should. Uh, it's very, very good to see you. Um, and I'm really grateful for you to make the hours time during what must be an, an outrageously busy schedule for you right now. Oh, it's really my pleasure. I really am a, a fan of the intellectual community you've built here, so I'm thrilled to be a part of it. Well, thank you so much. Um, on behalf of the thousands of people involved, uh, I really appreciate that. Thank you. We have a, a tradition, um, Mr. Undersecretary, which is asking people to introduce. Please call me James. I can do that. All right. I'm I'm always erring on the side of formality. Uh, <laughs> James, we ask people to introduce themselves by talking about what they're doing next. So, what's coming up for you in the next year or so? And I, I mean, uh, I can only guess, which is why I have to ask. So, what are the what are the big policies, the big projects, and the big ideas that are uppermost in your mind right now for the next year? Yeah. So, um, you know, we're really focused on follow through right now. Um, we've made a lot of progress in the last few weeks on the FAFSA and we're focused on encouraging students who may have been waiting. Now is the time to come fill out the FAFSA. Um, we're planning for next year. Uh, we're also working very hard on student debt relief and the president mm. has made a number of proposals, um, in his uh, speech in April, most recently, and we're focused on finalizing those programs and, and starting to implement them. Um, and, uh, you know, finally, you know, Secretary is very focused on his vision of a higher education system that um, is rewarded for being inclusive, for delivering value, for delivering strong outcomes. Mm -hmm. And so we're continuing to try to identify uh, the people who are walking that walk in higher education already and uh, help them get um, the resources and uh, the recognition um, that they're entitled to. Oh, excellent. Excellent. That's an enormous amount of work. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm staggered by the ambition and how much work is there. Um, we begin usually by asking people a couple of really, really introductory questions just to get the ball rolling, to get people you know, introduced and to get people thinking in the audience. And I, I, I have one I'd like to start with, if, if you don't mind. And this is a kind of introduction to your work kind of question. Um, what, what role should everyone here know about that the Department of Education plays in helping shape higher education's future? What does the DOE do to help you know, assist and, and, and guide and support colleges and universities as we move forward in a pretty challenging time? Yeah, well, the biggest role we play, of course, is in the student aid programs. And so, um, you know, we work to define uh, the terms and conditions of student aid, um, how large are Pell Grants, uh, what terms are student loans borrowed under, um, and, um, who can access those benefits. Right. You know, I think a lot of, um, the impact, um, we have on the future of higher education is in that effort of, um, defining or striking the balance between promoting innovation that is serving students well, while also, uh, protecting students against taking out loans they can't afford to repay. Hmm. Um, which unfortunately, you know, historically has happened in the name of innovation in the past. Indeed. Indeed. Um, 
that's our, you know, that's by far our single largest role. We have um, additional grant programs uh, mm-hmm. to support under resource institutions to um, yeah. help uh, students from all backgrounds attend and graduate from college uh, to promote innovation. Um, we have quite a bit of data um, that we use. You know, I think we have some unique data that can shed a light on, on trends. Um, so those are some of the some of the other pieces of the puzzle here. Is the uh, NCES data, um, is that under you? It's not. That's an independent branch of the um, department. It's, it's insulated uh, from political appointees. Well, I guess there's some benefits to that, then I, I, I can I can readily imagine. Um, well, thank you, thank you for the clarity and uh, and um, and direction of that answer. And in fact, here let me just uh, fiddle with the screen a little bit. Let me make uh, make us a little more a little more balanced. Um, the, um, the 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 second question, and and again, this is this is you know by by way of introduction, um, is to think uh, higher education right now is in the by a lot of estimations, including my own, a very perilous state. Uh, we've experienced enrollment declining for a decade. Uh, public universities, uh, overall, the trend has been for uh, underfunding them. Uh, the reputation of higher education has been suffering by based on all kinds of polls, and no doubt the next surveys will continue that trend. And as we have a national uh, election coming up, no doubt higher education will become a political football. Um, how, how can the Department of Education help us? How can it support us uh, as we try to navigate these very stormy seas? Yeah, well, um, you know, I think the the secretary uh, and all of us here are big believers in higher education. That's why we do what we do. I imagine that's true for um, most people listening. And it's hard to, it's hard for me to imagine, you know, solving the most important problems our country has without strong colleges and universities, whether you're talking about raising livery standards from generation to generation, creating more equitable opportunity, uh, solving the great research challenges from COVID to climate change to many more, um, to helping us understand each other across, you know, all the divides and controversy in our country right now. So, you know, I think that, um, uh, um, in a sense, um, the criticism of higher education is a is a backhanded compliment because <laughs> um, people have such high expectations for what colleges and universities can deliver. They have um, so many hopes pinned on them. Indeed. And um, the question is, what can we do to to live up to that potential that you know that our country badly needs? Well, that's that's a great answer, and and personally, I'm delighted that you mentioned climate change. Uh, I should probably point to the book over my shoulder that I've written on this subject, but um, uh, I love that backhanded compliment. That's that's a really really positive way of thinking of this. Uh, friends, let me let me get out of the way. Let me uh, open the floor to your questions and comments now. Uh, Undersecretary Kvall has just outlined a whole series of topics, um, questions, uh, trends, and things that the Department of Education is working on. Uh, let's hear from you all. And again, if you're new to the forum, on the very bottom of the screen is a white strip. Uh, so just either click the raised hand if you want to join us on stage by video, or click the question mark to type in a uh, question or a comment. And as I say that, people are already entering these all over the place, James. So let me just bring a couple of these up. And some of these are from a longtime friends. And it's good to see them. This is from John Hollenbeck in Madison, Wisconsin. Please comment on how non-traditional and lifelong learners are part of the DOE's vision for higher education. Yeah, well, of course, I mean, non-traditional is now most college students. And, you know, I think there is sometimes a a shorthand or a prejudice that when we talk about student aid or student loans, we're talking about four year colleges. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. But of course our programs support community colleges and and career schools as well. Um, You know, the idea that um, truck drivers don't have student loans, that's not necessarily the case. Uh, We do make student loans for career schools. Um, You know, I think uh, the, um, Composition of the student body uh, is well known within the higher education community, but I think it's it's not well appreciated um, outside. And um, we need to do uh, a better job, I think, educating um, 
broader uh, policy community, um, both about um, the challenges our students face. Um, students are often excluded from nutrition or housing or healthcare assistance on the mm -hmm. assumption that they're mm -hmm. upper middle class students. Mm -hmm. And they're literally eligibility rules written specifically to keep um, students out. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And also, you know, I think we need to um, uh, be um, a stronger part of um, contributions about shaping our country's future. And, you know, this um, president has um, identified some industries that um, he believes are worthy of investment that are critical to the future of our country, um, clean energy infrastructure, microchips, others. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that's a bit of a change of direction from recent presidents who have adopted a more industry neutral uh, economic strategy. Um, and, you know, I would like to see higher education saying, you know, like we're a part of that. You know, if you want to dominate um, clean energy industries, if you want to dominate microchips, we're going to need workers from, you know, associate degrees and industry certificates all the way up to PhDs. Um, you know, let's be a part of the solution of, um, of building the country um, that is, you know, that has prosperity and that has um, widely shared um, income gains. Uh, thank you for that for excellent, very thoughtful and detailed answer. And uh, thank you to uh, our good friend, John, uh, for posing the question. If you're new to the forum, friends, that's an example of a Q&A question. Uh, and also, by the way, if you have questions in the chat, it'd be easier if you could just put that into the uh, Q&A box, because that way I can display it on the screen for everybody. Uh, and uh, let me now transition to a video question, because we have our good friend Brent Anders from the American University of Armenia. So he's, as usual, coming to us from late at night in that country. And let me just bring him up on stage. Hello, sir. Good to see you. Hello. Great to see all of you. Um, so, OK, I'll get right to my question. Um, thank you very much for, for this talk, because it's, it's great to, to have somebody of your caliber. So I've been working with a lot of different universities to help them with the integration of AI literacy within the curriculum, within the university itself in many different ways. And there's lots of resistance at different levels for different reasons. My question is, given that the, the Department of Education has given lots of different uh, reports and, and guidelines talking about the imperative of, a, of AI literacy and how everyone needs to develop this. Are there different mechanisms that the government is thinking about? Maybe you, mm -hmm. you talked about the importance of the value of the education. I don't see how we can ensure value of our education if we don't start to integrate some of these important things, such as different AI literacy skills within the curriculum, ensuring that when a, a student goes through and gets a higher education, that that includes an understanding of how to use AI properly, effectively, ethically. These are important skills that they're going to need to have in order to ensure that the United States has a, you know, a firm grip on industry and employment. So can you talk a little bit about that and maybe some future plans? Yeah, I mean, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Um, we don't make uh, curricular decisions here. That's probably for the best, um, but we certainly are um, part of the conversation about the impact that AI is having on uh, what we teach and how we teach. Um, we convene um, experts here. We um, produce materials for folks interested in exploring it. And, you know, I think that, um, you know, the potential that AI has to revolutionize um, uh, educational opportunities is really exciting. Um, and it could uh, be a very powerful force for bringing high quality instruction to many more uh, people. Um, and, you know, I think the work it sounds like you're doing is really critical. The, the, the experts I talk to um, think it's not, uh, the AI is unlikely to eliminate uh, jobs so much as to fundamentally change how we do our jobs. Mm, right. um, so we're mm -hmm. all gonna need to have some, some understanding of AI. You know, I think the challenge um, for higher education is going to be um, increased pressure to demonstrate um, skills and competencies. I think 
hmm. workers and students are going to want to know what they can do now and how to get to the next level. Um, employers are going to want to know exactly what graduates can do and which programs can teach them those skills. And that's going to put uh, pressure on us as educators to um, be able to define um, particularly the, the, the skills that will remain intrinsically human, um, mm -hmm. like teamwork mm -hmm. or empathy. How are we going to be able to um, tell students and employers, this is where you are and we can help you get to the next level? Right. I just see that the the rate of increase of the, the capabilities of AI are going at this level mm -hmm. and then higher education is adapting at, at this level, right? So that there needs to be more of a push. So that's what I'm always looking for is other ways to help higher education, academia in general, see the importance of this so that they can start to look at different ways to address it within their educational uh, institution. Yeah. You know, higher education is in some ways it's really resistant to change right. and it can feel frustrating. Um, but, you know, if you step back, there are a lot of things that have changed a lot over the last 10 or 15 years. Um, you know, the, the, the role of online uh, universities has changed. Yeah. In fact, it's harder to talk about online as separate from mm -hmm. uh, on-campus experience. Yes. Um, you know, one of my favorite examples is the developmental education reforms that, you know, went from overlooked issue to mm -hmm. implemented mm -hmm. almost everywhere within a few years. Um, so um, it can happen. I think it's, uh, you know, it's going to be a question of uh, finding the, the right moment uh, and, and delivering the right message at that time. Right. Well, that's a thank you. Appreciate that's it. That's a great question, Brent. Um, James, do you think when you're when you're talking about um, identifying more skills, uh, I mean, would you look towards micro credentials for that or expanded transcripts? I think those are I think those are going to be parts of the answer. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I think the, um, you know, the movement toward skills based hiring is is sometimes seen as uh -huh. oppositional to higher education. But, yeah. you know, uh, people are going to need to get those skills somewhere. And, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, you know, I, th I think it will be um, more of a pressure on us to articulate um, the skills that we're imparting as opposed to, um, you know, losing students to other sources. Oh, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, friends, this is a, that was an example of a video question, um, uh, even from an intercontinental video question. Uh, so if, you, if you'd like to follow um, Brent, you don't have to wear a tie, nor do you have to have a beard, um, but you can still join us. Just click the, <laughs> the raised hand button if you'd like. Uh, we have a whole bunch of questions coming in, James. Uh, the, the dam has broken, and uh, we have one from our excellent friend in Florida, James McGee. This is a very precise question. Um, about a state, but this applies to uh, the nation in an interesting way. Uh, Florida law now requires public colleges and universities to dump their accreditor and find another. But first, James, you have to approve changing the accreditor. How many Florida schools have so far been approved? Uh, I don't have the latest count. I know we've approved several mm. and uh, we have several more in process and um, you know, the question, you know, this is a, a relatively new authority or something that uh, the department changed its regulations within the last couple of years to um, allow uh, accreditors that traditionally have been regionally focused to accredit schools anywhere in the country. And, um, you know, we think um, there's some logic to that and schools may, um, may be able to find an accreditor that is better aligned with their mission or that they feel is better able to support their quality improvement. Um, and that's a good thing. Um, you know, what we would be concerned about is um, if it appears that an institution is um, choosing an accreditor to evade quality standards, mm -hmm. or if the dynamic mm -hmm. develops where there's a, a race to the bottom that undermines mm -hmm. a creditor's ability to um, enforce uh, standards. So that is, um, you know, that's the primary lens with which we're, we're looking at um, these types of requests. Well, that, that's a great answer. Um, and you've given us a glimpse of some future maneuverings. Um, thank you for that, James. And Glenn, as always, thank you for a, a very, very powerful question. 
Um, by the way, uh, coming up, uh, let's see, this should be on the 23rd of May. Uh, we're going to host uh, Stig Leshley, who is the president and founder of a brand new accrediting agency. So if you're or a new accreditor. So if you're interested in that, please join us. Um, we have more questions coming. And this is one from Carol Rava. And she uses an abbreviation I'm not sure about, James. So I, I, we, we may have to ask her to clarify, or you may already know it. But she says, um, can you share how ED is, to, is approaching measuring and being transparent about the value of higher education, including the G slash VFVT work and the recently announced value recognition idea? Yes, those acronyms are well known to me. Uh, I mean, I would start, you know, with the question of student debt. And we have, in recent decades, become comfortable with uh, student debt becoming the primary way that we pay for higher education. And, um, and the theory behind that is that there's an individual ROI to education and yeah. students can, will be able to repay their loans. You know, for me, I was fortunate to go to some excellent universities and although I, I didn't enjoy my student loans, it was a small price to pay for the education I got. Um, but there are a lot of people out there struggling and, you know, we can see uh, in our portfolios and in the students we talk to, you know, one in three borrowers don't graduate. Um, black borrowers typically wow. owe as much after a decade as they borrowed because interest is accruing as fast as they can pay these loans down. There are people out there that owe loans for 20, 30, 40 years. Um, is that on your side, James? I'm sorry? Is that uh, ringing on your side? No, I don't hear ringing anyway. Okay, well that's okay. Then I went away. Um, okay, sorry. Please, so. please, please continue. Yeah, so, so I think you know I think that's um, that's a challenge. There are a lot of people out there who are carrying loans that they're struggling with. And that's a problem for them. That's a problem for their families, for their communities. Yes. And obviously, the president has been quite aggressive in asking us to make sure that people are getting the relief that they're entitled to um, under the terms of the student loan program. And that's a whole other conversation, Brian. But, you know, when we start to look at where all these unaffordable loans come from, um, you know, I'm, there continues to be a disproportionate amount that comes from uh, for-profit colleges, um, increasingly graduate school, uh, master's yeah. professional programs are an area of concern. And then parent loans, I would say, are the, you know, the three areas that kind of jump out as of concern to us. Um, and we have uh, uh, put in place um, the gainful employment rules that uh, have come and gone in recent years. Um, and we started um, collecting data so that we will know um, actual earnings and, and actual borrowing under those programs and um, those career programs that are intended to provide an economic benefit will have to show that um, that they are in fact meeting some minimum threshold. It's not a high threshold. Um, the financial value transparency, you know, we've been criticized in the past or this rule has been criticized in the past as applying only to certain programs, for-profit programs, mm -hmm. career programs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we'll be collecting apples to apples data across the higher education sector. Oh, wow. And, um, you know, that way, you know, if a student is about to take out a loan to go to a master's program, you know, they may not be interested in the economic return, um, but they will have access to um, the data, what the data show about whether the, whether the loan um, leaves, was likely to leave them in a position to pay it off or not. Oh, that's very, very powerful data to gather. Um, Thank you for doing that. And again, um, thank you for the question. Um, we have more questions coming in, and one is from the chat. So, James, I'm just going to read this one out loud because I, I won't be able to flash it on the screen. But it's a it's a pretty precise question. It's from our good friend Mark DeFusco, who says, The Morrill Act invested in higher education as a public good. Governor Edmund Brown set California's master plan as an investment which fueled talent in the state to fuel the economy. It seems like since then there's been a regression to college as a personal good. Where do we stand now? And I think that question is a good response to what you were just talking about in terms of debt. 
Yeah, I mean, I think we are making progress in the sense that I think this debate is being reignited now. And um, the question about what it means to invest in higher education, what does it mean to create opportunities uh, for young people, um, is one that is very much at the center of the political debate right now. It's controversial. Um, but, you know, I think the debate around student loan relief is, you know, on one hand, there are, you know, there are people that say, I didn't take out a loan. Uh, right. I have nothing. There's nothing in this for me. Mm -hmm. And there are other people who are saying, you know, we all have a stake in, in making sure that loans are affordable, that college is affordable. Um, you know, the president has a proposal for uh, eliminating tuition at community colleges that um, unfortunately Congress hasn't yet seen the wisdom of, but it's an idea that um, has a lot of momentum at the state and local level from Maine and Massachusetts to New Mexico and California. Um, there's a lot of progress being made. A lot of people are excited by that idea. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, we are seeing emerging signs of interest in investing in the higher education system that we want to have. Well, um, and we also have seen state governments, some of them do different things to try to fund community college in, in different ways. Um, I, I appreciate that vision. Just on a personal note, as someone who is not only still paying his student loans, but is also helping pay his children's student loans, uh, we appreciate all, all the activity on, on that front. Uh, we have uh, uh, another video question coming in from uh, a friend in the far north, Fritz Vandover at the University of Minnesota. And uh, this is the, uh, further evidence that you do not need a beard to be on the program. Fritz. <laughs> Hi. Good, good afternoon. It's good, it's good to see you, sir. How are you doing? I'm great, Brian. It's great to see you. And thank you for facilitating a really a great conversation. My apologies, gentlemen, for not wearing a tie. I can get the memo. <laughs> off, um, off with you. So... Uh, and I will, James, as you uh, stated your preference, James, um, and someone mentioned earlier, one of the questions, you know, a lot of times higher education is, despite the, the stigma, it has pivoted many times in its history in the United States. And a lot of times those pivots were from, someone mentioned the Morrill Act, Wisconsin Idea, you know, Higher Education Act, GI Bill, the, these big federal legislative and sometimes just policy moves what are the kinds of like what are, are there moves at the department of education or the federal government that you think should happen maybe they're not going to happen maybe they're not even on your radar but what is the what is something that the department of education could and should do and i invite everyone to chime with their ideas that allows that next pivot because those pivots often they were often investments and those investments bore giant dividends for the country just everyone knows the gi bill kind of narrative that it unleashed all this knowledge and all this economic activity and growth in the post-World War II period that lasted for a long time and still has echoes. But what else What else can the Department of Education do, or maybe at the federal level, the Congress, if it would happen? But, you know, what can be done to create another big pivot? Because higher education is in the, it's doing a kind of pivot we don't want right now, which is a retraction, regression. Yes, a lot of population dynamics in there, demographics. But still the need for higher education, the need for post-secondary education, it's never been higher, in my opinion. That's what I tell people. You can't really exist. Out, you can't do much after high school with just a diploma. So it's a big question. You wanted to, you wanted to create discussion, Brian. Well, hopefully I've helped do that. Indeed. Indeed you have. James, what do you think? Thanks, Fritz. And yeah, let's uh, collect some ideas in the chat. That would be great. Um, you know, I think... Uh, you know, one project that clearly we have well underway is um, thinking differently about how we finance uh, higher education and moving away from debt financing. Um, president's budget, we've increased Pell Grants by $900. His budget would double it. Um, it's calls for free college. Um, wow. You know, and that's done within, the, within a budget that um, reduces the deficit by several trillion dollars. And so it is... Um, a blueprint that shows how these choices are possible in a responsible way. Um, you know, I think um, uh, I think working on the reliability with which higher education lives up to its promise is important, um, especially when we're in a student debt era. 
Um, and we've made a lot of progress increasing the national graduation rate. We're now at 62%, so still some room for improvement, um, below 50% for students of color. But if you look at the trend line, it is pretty exciting. And I think um, part of that uh, shift, it's going to be one, you know, inch by inch. But underlying that is a cultural change about like who college is for. Hmm. And um, I think we are moving away from an idea that uh, we should have gatekeeping courses that weed students out. And that is a sign of their rigor to, you know, to a mindset that um, recognizes that we can help more of our students learn and graduate and go on to a better life. You know, I think that is, um, you know, a transformational step from the fight for access um, over the last 50 or 60 years toward a, a toward a, a, a higher education system that, you know, is a real driver of equity, of workforce development, uh, of opportunity for everybody. I'm drowning in questions that I want to keep asking, and I know Brian, there's probably lots of them. But one thing I, one thing I don't think that gets enough attention, I don't know if the DOE looks at this, is the relationship between tuition, upper tuition pressure, and higher and healthcare costs. The costs to carry healthcare for institutions, small and large. I know it's the pressure is real, and I, I'd love to see some kind of attention on that because I've many institutions I've been at CFOs talk about how they're struggling to contain those costs, and then inevitably. They, they must get passed on. They do get passed on. There's other factors too, but I, that's something I think it's very little attention. And I, you know, as a official higher ed wonk, I feel like that's somewhere in the mix. That's just not getting, you know, hmm. easing one eases the other, but I digress. Yeah. yeah, definitely a lot of parallels there, Fritz. I think that's a, um, it's a great point. Well, thank you. And and Fritz, thank you very much for the, for the great questions. Um, uh, friends, please you know, use the chat box to uh, uh, fire off uh, more thoughts about that. And James, thank you for the really good answer. Um, in, I think in response to what you've just been saying, uh, we have a, a question from a former student of mine, uh, which might prove very uh, nicely connected. Anel Albertao asks, in your opinion, how can universities be more inclusive so that access to higher education is more equitable? That's yeah, a broad question as well and a good one. Um, you know, one of the nice parts of my job is I get to visit uh, some of these campuses and uh, yeah. meet the leadership teams and meet some of the students. And, you know, I think there are obviously many different approaches, but three commonalities, I would say. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, one is expectations and, um, you know, a culture that um, every student can succeed and it's, mm. Um, mm. you know, uh, the job of the institution to create uh, those kinds of possibilities and to embrace that mission that, uh, as opposed to, you know, climbing U.S. news, becoming more selective, uh, prioritizing facilities. Um, the second is use of data. And, mm, you know, mm, mm. there aren't um, magic bullets. Um, you know, we really just need to take a very close look at, you know, where students are getting stuck and what we can do. We need to bring together different parts of the campuses, which is um, easier said than done in the traditional higher ed culture. But, you know, we need the registrar sitting with the financial aid office, sitting with student support services and talking about how to break down these problems and who owns them and can we get mm. a little better every year. And mm. then the third part, which was a little slow to dawn on me because I'm a little more of an analytical person, but, mm. you know, I think the importance of a sense of belonging you know, really can oh. be overstated. Yeah. And whether that is um, work of the faculty mm -hmm. or the staff or mm -hmm. um, peer students, you know, it's just really critical that we're intentional about making sure that students know that they belong on campus, um, that they're capable of succeeding on campus, um, that they're not alone, that um, there are people that they relate to um, who are on this journey or have succeeded in this journey. Um, and being really intentional about that uh, is critical. Well, that is a fantastic, fantastic answer that we can take away and apply across the board. Thank you, James. And Anel, always good to see you. Thank you for the very, very sharp question. Uh, 
we have uh, we have more coming in. I want to make sure that everyone gets a chance to uh, to share. This is actually a two part question from uh, an assistant dean at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, Gabriella Weaver, who is a wonderful person. So let me just put this up as two different <laughs> two different uh, displays. You'll see what I mean. First, the National Academy of Science is working on a study about equitable and effective teaching in the higher ed, a preliminary version of the report in December 2023 for public comment, and they expect to, dramatic pause here, <laughs> and then have the final version out this fall. What can the federal government do to help motivate higher education institutions to teach using research-based practices like those in this report? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think typically our role here is... Um, more around um, the soapbox and trying to highlight mm -hmm. um, the practices that we think are important. Mm -hmm. um, we've had a series of convenings that we call uh, raise the bar around, um, you know, some of the folks that we've identified as national leaders in, in key aspects of student success. We had um, a really great conference on the use of data. Uh, we just had one a couple of weeks ago about um, advising and student support services. Uh, we've talked about the transfer problem. And, um, you know, that's something that that I hope will continue. And I think, um, you know, a National Academies report, that's something that gets a lot of attention. I don't know how much help uh, from us uh, it needs, but it would be uh, certainly a worthwhile uh, topic of conversation. Excellent. Um, well, Assistant Dean Weaver, thank you so much uh, for the point, that pointer. I'm going to follow up with you and ask you uh, for more information. If that's coming out this fall, we should probably have a session about it here on the forum. Uh, James, in the in the chat, uh, Josh, I, which I, I'm not asking you to read because it's a fire hose right now. Josh Meredith says, love that note by Undersecretary Cavall. I work in student life. Facilitating connections among students is my job, and it's crucial to their success. So thanks, Josh. That's thanks. great. Uh, more questions coming in. We have one from uh, Heidi Overshot uh, at uh, Fisher College. Now, the kind of technical question, but a very powerful question here. Uh, thoughts on credit hours for bachelor's degree, 90 credit versus 120. Seems that there's some interesting conversations happening in many states and starting to involve regional accreditors. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it is worth having that conversation. The, you know, the, there's nothing magical about 120 hours and, you know, the question is uh, ultimately are we preparing students for um, what their goals are a job a career a better life and um, you know i think we do need to pay more attention to uh, articulating our goals for educational programs and trying to um, measure them and it could be that other durations um, of degrees are, are appropriate or desirable um, you know we have some work to do, you know, even with the context of the four-year degree. Um, you know, most students take more than five years to complete. Um, mm -hmm. You know, a lot of students, mm -hmm. um, a lot of students take excess credits that they don't need. Yeah. Um, so, you know, as someone who has a little bit of a of a bias toward more education, um, you know, I think uh, I would start by trying to help people get through. And graduate on time before uh, cutting back the amount of education, but um, but I do think it's worth exploring, um, you know, alternative degree links as well. Oh, uh, good answer, uh, very thoughtful answer, James, and thank you for the really good question, um, Professor Hundershot. Um, we have uh, uh, more questions coming in. We have one from a student who only goes by the name of Claudette. So hello, Claudette, and I'm glad to see you here. Uh, and she asks, how does the federal government contribute to building trust in the scientific knowledge produced by higher education institutions amidst the era of fake news? Good question, Claudette. Yeah, that's a great question too. I would love to see some advice in the chat on that one as well. You know, um, I can tell you, you know, the work we do is very much grounded in um, data and academic evidence. Um, we take very seriously the the real world consequences of the decisions we make and um, do our best to make sure that, um, you know, that whatever policies we adopt are, are carried out to the to the benefit of students and taxpayers and others. And, um, uh, you know, try not to get distracted by uh, some of the noise and some of the other things. Um, you know, I think we're 
we're really proud of the work that we do day to day and week to week and and the progress we're making. And, um, you know, I think that's that's the contribution that that we have to offer. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, great question. Um, we have uh, more questions coming in. We have a couple from people who couldn't make it here today, and I, I promised them I would ask. Uh, one comes from our excellent friend, uh, Don Shawless, uh, who is just a, a terrific higher education observer. And he asks a political question. And again, and this is not just James, but this is definitely under Secretary Kvall. I understand limitations of being able to answer this. He points to uh, some of the project plans produced for a hypothetical Trump administration next year, like the Project 2025 uh, playbook. And he wants to know how should higher education be anticipating or uh, readying for such things should that come to pass? And again, I understand if you know limitations on being able to answer. Yeah, I mean, I, my day job here is uh, is on the government and uh, uh, not the politics or not the campaign. Um, you know, I think for my own part, I do think you know my life. I try to pay attention to. Um, I try to pay attention to what um, the campaigns and also, you know, the, the think tanks and the other places that employ people who might staff the next administration um, are saying. Sure. Um, uh, sometimes their critique of our work, you know, has a valid point that uh, it's worth us reflecting on. Um, you know, at other times, um, you know, they um, uh, advocate for some perspectives that I really strongly disagree with. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but I, I do think it is important to take them seriously um, because those often are, um, you know, the, the ideas from the think tanks, uh, whoever is, is not currently in government often do become um, the agenda after the next election. So I do think it's worth paying attention to. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, Don, when you listen to this, thank you for the good question. And I, I put a link to the document that he shared uh, in the book. And thank you. I appreciate the, the delicate and tactful answer, um, as well as the candid one. Uh, we have a question from the splendid David Scobie uh, coming to us today from Elon University, the head of the Paradigm Project, among other things, including bringing theory to practice. And he asks a question to follow up on one thing you've said. The US government support has focused on aid to students. How about a pivot to aid direct support, sorry, to add direct support for institutions that are innovative and inclusive? The states are often shortchanging them. Hi, hi David, good to uh, see your name. I was watching your appearance in this forum last night. Um, uh, I think it's definitely an idea worth considering. Um, you know, the, the, the structure we have of um, direct to student uh, has some real benefits. Um, but uh, it misses part of the picture. Um, we also um, do not have a relationship with states. And a lot of our goals for the higher education system, you know, cannot be achieved without active partnership of states. Um, but federal policy kind of bypasses them entirely. Yeah, um, yeah. You, you know, we have made a priority uh, of investing in um, HBCUs, tribal colleges, other minority serving institutions and low resource institutions. So we've increased those um, budget line items every year. They tend to be relatively small, but I frequently hear, maybe this is selection bias, but I frequently hear, you know, how even a, a six figure grant of uh, flexible innovative funding on a campus can, uh, can make a mm -hmm. big difference. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, you know, I think the idea of a, of a partnership between uh, the federal government and states to think about um, how do we finance a higher education system in a way that is um, equitable, um, promotes affordability and strong outcomes, is sustainable through the economic cycle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's a really big uh, policy question for the higher ed community. Thank you for that answer. And uh, David, thank you for the very important question. Um, we are, are coming up uh, on the last 10 minutes of the hour. So this is a, a time for you to get in your questions before the clock runs out. Uh, and we have a, a whole bunch that have been coming in that are very creative and very interesting, as well as some that are, are, are pretty technical or are focused on, on specific issues and, and problems. Um, for example, there's one um, from um, Glenn McGee, again, which is a, uh, it, 
not a philosophical question, a strategic question. Uh, it has to do with credential inflation. And so this touches back, James, on your point about uh, people being able to get jobs without higher education degrees. And he says, what concrete steps can be taken to slow down credential inflation that is spiraling out of control? So for, for those who don't know, the term credential inflation refers to jobs and other positions that are requiring more and more uh, education degrees uh, for jobs um, and the way that higher education has to support that. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think, um, you know, we've hit on this a couple of times. I think there's going to be greater and greater demand for an ability to articulate, you know, exactly what a person can do and what skills a program is teaching yeah. and um you know as the there's sort of a tendency to think about economic change as something that's just around the corner but we're already in mm -hmm. a period of economic change uh, that is astounding um i have a, a toddler at home and he loves uh richard scary so what do people do all day oh my gosh very familiar with that book and yeah. uh you know apart from you know, the incredible transformation in gender roles, of course, which are really outdated in that book, but also mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just the description of the everyday economy feels very, very dated. And you yeah. know, it's hard to explain to him what a phone booth is and what a newspaper <laughs> is, um, <laughs> because we have digital subscriptions, we do subscribe. But um, so, uh, and that's only going to accelerate. Um, economic change is just going to accelerate. Um, yeah. And so, um, more and more people are going to need to know what can I do uh, uh, now and what do I need to know and how do I get it? Um, so we're just going to have to get much more concrete than, you know, generally this is what a college graduate is. Um, and I, I think that's a, a really urgent priority for us as a community is, you know, can we develop that Rosetta Stone so that um, employers and educators and um, students are all speaking the same language about the skills that they uh, that they need. Oh, thank you, thank you, Glenn. I appreciate you uh, following up on that theme. And uh, I, I, James, I like the way that you connect this back to the question of of um, yeah, not diplomas, but you know, credentialing um, and uh, demonstrating what's learned. Uh, we have a question from one more person who couldn't make it today. Uh, this is uh, Patricia Clay, and she asks a very frank question that I admire. Uh, she says, what is the Department of Education planning next that higher education should prepare for? <laughs> well, you know, our focus right now is really following through. Right. And, um, you know, it's really apparent to me that um, the question isn't, what does the policy say on paper? The question is, are you are you carrying it out? And, you know, at the start of this administration, you know, we found that most people who were eligible for loan forgiveness were not actually getting it. Most people that we knew were eligible for loan forgiveness. So, for example, you know, we had 300,000 people who were getting disability insurance through Social Security. And uh, as, as a result, we knew they were eligible to have their student loans discharged. Uh, because they had a permanent disability, but not only were we not, were they still making payments on their loans? In some cases, we were actually garnishing their disability payments um, to make payments on defaulted student loans. That's awful. Um, so when we talk about, you know, administration off talks about we're proud of having canceled 4 million people's student loans. Those are people that were eligible for programs, uh, but they weren't getting their relief because they attended a, a, a closed school or they were public servants, or they uh -huh, had been cheated uh -huh. by a for-profit college. Uh -huh. um, you know, that's going to continue to be our focus here. We want to follow through on um, the FAFSA. We want to follow through on the student debt relief um, policies that the president has talked about. And we want to make sure that, um, you know, that we're paying attention to the implementation and that um, those benefits are reaching students. Well, very good. Um, thank you for that answer. Um, and people are sharing all kinds of comments about uh, some of the some of the real human woe involved in this, uh, including garnishing disability checks and, and the, the time to get uh, to get things done. Um, well, first of all, uh, Patricia, thank you for that for that really frank question, which uh, which is great. Uh, we have an even more. Um, actually, let, let, let me let me hang back on that ultimate question. Let me give you one more. This is from uh, New York State, from uh, Hope Wendell at SUNY Coyle. 
And she asks a really, really good question. I don't think we've touched on this yet. Departments of Education in Japan, Netherlands, Colombia, Australia, put funds towards professional development for virtual exchange slash COIL, and COIL stands for Collaborative Online International Learning. Uh, will we or you follow suit? I think that's a great idea. We do have some funding for international education exchange programs, and um, you know, we'd love to learn more about that and take a look at that. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, uh, and hope. Um, good luck with that work. Uh, you're doing that work. It feels like international, working across sixty odd uh, New York State's um, institutions. That's a, a great deal of work. Um, here's the here's the final question. This is the this is the biggie. I've been saving this one up because it's 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 so good. This is from um, Mitchell College's Karen Belnier. Uh, who asks this simple but devastating question. If you could wave a wand, what, <laughs> what three things would you change about higher education? Uh, well, uh, I think, uh, gosh, that is tough. I'm going to say, you know, we've touched on them, though. Hmm. Um, I think that we need to invest in our young people instead of asking them to take out loans that we know from the data they're going to be unlikely to be able to repay and we should invest in the higher education system that we want so that it's affordable for people and people have a path to a degree and, and a brighter future um i think the second thing is to um change our culture and educate in higher education and our expectations around excellence Hmm. to recognize that there are multiple forms of excellence hmm. and hmm. Um, turning away more students at a time when our country needs many more students to get a college degree. You know, it's not, it's not what we need um, from our higher education sector, um, higher costs, um, you know, yeah. putting reputations above um, measurable outcomes. Hmm. Um, you know, let's take a look at, um, uh, the higher education system that we need now. And, you know, we're very, we're very lucky to have in this country, you know, some of the world's finest research institutions, um, some of the world's best liberal arts colleges, but we also need um, other forms of colleges and universities um, that serve their local communities, that give people affordable and reliable paths to graduation and careers that are forced, that are drivers of local uh, workforce development. Right. And, you know, let's not take those institutions for granted. Let's celebrate them because that's really important. Um, right. That's only two things, but I feel really strongly about those two things. So I'm going to leave it there. Well, two for three is a, is a, is a great record on this score, James. <laughs> and, and Karen, thank you for that uh, terrific question. Um, in, in the chat, by the way, they've had uh, a, a lot of praise for this. Uh, Mark DeFusco says, uh, thank you, grateful for you and all you do. Um, and then I have time for one uh, last question for myself, uh, which is a topic which has come up in, in our forum for years, something that I've, I've been researching a bit, uh, which has to do with demographics. Um, and basically, the you know the United States is producing fewer and fewer kids. We're living longer and longer. And if it weren't for uh, a big immigrant immigration immigrant population, uh, our overall population would be uh, shrinking. How how can the Department of Education help higher education grapple with this really interesting development? Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's uh, it's top of mind for a lot of college uh, presidents that I talk to as well same here. um you know i think um obviously a lot of colleges and universities are shifting into the adult market uh -huh. um i think that's a that's a positive development there are a lot of people who um who need skills and credentials um who are older than traditional undergraduates i think that's you know going to continue um to grow um as the economy continues to change um, I also think um, student retention is an area um, that is really untapped. And there was a question, I think, from uh -huh. friends earlier about uh -huh. um, college costs. You know, there are a lot of ways to retain more students in ways that are even cost beneficial. I mean, some of the things to increase student retention are really expensive, but there are some things that are not really expensive. And um, 
if we are able to um, serve more students and um, strength, strengthen the economics of our institutions uh, by helping students succeed at higher rates, that's a win across the board. So where we can find those opportunities, you know, we really ought to pursue them. Oh, that's an excellent answer. Uh, thank you, James. And thank you. It's the top of the hour now, and we have to wrap things up. Thank you for being with us for a terrific hour of conversation. What's the what's the best way for people to keep up with your work? Um, should we follow the Department of Education website? Or are you uh, are you an active LinkedIn user? Or what, what's the best way to... <laughs> no, I wish. No, uh, I do have a Twitter account. I'm kind of a little inconsistent on it. I think probably uh, the Department Twitter. Uh, I read my email, james.qual at ed.gov. So, you know, I welcome your listeners to, um, to send me a note. Thank and, you. Um, you know, look, I really, I've been clicking around on people's bios and getting a sense of who's here. I've appreciated the, uh, the very insightful and thought-provoking questions and, uh, uh, you know, really the incredible collection of people that's been participating in this hour. So thank you, uh, Brian, for, for including me. And, uh, you know, congratulations on... Um, on building such a uh, interesting and thought-provoking community. Oh, thank you uh, on behalf of everybody. Thank you so much, James. I really appreciate it. And good luck uh, with the rest of this year. Uh, hopefully, we can uh, bring you back in another year to uh, catch up with you and see what you've been, uh, what's been happening since. I'd love that. You're welcome to come by. Excellent. Take care, James. Thanks. Bye. -bye. But friends, don't leave yet. Uh, let me just uh, first of all uh, repeat that compliment. Uh, that compliment is aimed squarely at all of you. Thank you for all the great questions and thoughts. Uh, this has been a terrific, terrific hour. If you'd like to keep talking about this stuff, if you'd like to try and find uh, the Department of Education on Twitter and tweet at them, or if you'd like to continue this conversation on Mastodon threads or Blue Sky or my blog, here are all the links there. Just use the hashtag FTTE to make it easy to find. If you'd like to look into our previous sessions, which touches on everything that we've discussed from demographics to uh, credentials to the three or four year um, period for graduation, take a look at their archive, Tiny URL dot com slash FDF archive. And thanks again for everybody for a really, really great conversation. I hope you're all doing well in the Northern Hemisphere. Summer is beginning to settle in. I uh, hope you're all safe and sound. And we'll see you next time online. Take care. Bye bye. <laughs>